Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for our monthly corn and soybean outlook update. I'm Jim Mitter, professor and director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, and joining me today are my colleagues, Dr. Nathan Thompson, who's an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics, and Michael Langemeyer, who is a professor in agricultural economics and also the associate director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture. We're broadcasting today because USDA released updated world ag supply demand estimates on Friday. And so there was a lot of information on Friday's report, not only the uh, world ag supply demand estimates, but also an updated crop production report, which included some acreage adjustments. So let's get right to it. Um, and that says July on it. I've already got one typo. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's not July, it's the actually September World Ag Supply Demand Estimate. So um, USDA did revise the carryover estimate from the 2020 crop into the 2021 crop year um, up to 1.187 billion bushels. That's about 7.9% of projected or actual usage. And they increased the marketing year corn average price to 445 from 440 a bushel. Um, looking at the 2021 crop balance sheet, which really got most of the attention, uh, USDA adjusted the harvested acreage estimate up by 590,000 acres. Um, and they announced about 10 days or so ahead of the report that they were going to be looking at the acreage. This largely was a result of them looking at the Farm Service Agency information and using that to make some adjustments to the June uh, acreage report that they had previously published. So I think we all knew they were going to come out with an acreage estimate. Most people thought it was going to rise somewhat compared to the prior estimate, and that's exactly what happened. They also raised the yield projection from 174.6, which remember a month ago was surprisingly low, to 176.3 bushels per acre. That combination of increase in acreage and increase in yield pushed the production estimate for the 21 crop up by 246 million bushels compared to August. There was no change in projected ethanol usage for the 2021 crop year, still at 5.2 billion bushels. Uh, they raised projected exports by 75 million bushels compared to what they forecast last month. That puts that at 2.475 billion bushels. That's about 10% less than their estimate for 2020. And they raised the projected ending stocks, the carryover from the 2021 crop into the 2022 crop year uh, by 75 million bushels compared to last month. So they're at 1.4 billion bushels. And that pushes that carryover back up over 1.4, which is where it was earlier. We'll talk a little bit more about those changes over time later in the broadcast. Um, ending stocks at the end projected uh, at the end of the 2021 crop year projected to be just under 10% of usage at about 9.5% of total usage. On the world side, um, no real change in Brazil's corn production that raised Argentina's slightly. Um, no change in China's expected imports from all sources. Um, compared to what they had published previously back in August. And I mentioned earlier, if you look at the yield numbers, um, it puts that yield for the 2021 crop, not all the way back to the trend line, but it gets it a lot closer. And of course, the big surprise a month ago was how low USDA's yield estimate was. This brings it back, I won't say all the way to a trend line, depending on how you estimate your trend line, it was probably about 178 to 179, depending on exactly how you slice the years. Um, so we're still below trend, but certainly a, a better, higher, stronger yield estimate than what we saw last month. And Michael, I know you took a look at the individual state estimates. There were some big revisions on some of the individual states. What were some of those? Yeah, there were some revisions both in the eastern Corn Belt and, and the northern plains. For example, Indiana was three bushels higher than the previous es estimate, but more importantly, from a production standpoint, uh, some of the states that were really low, in particular Minnesota, uh, were some pretty large increases. Uh, now the yield is expected to be 174 in Minnesota. Uh, you know, certainly still less than last year, uh, but that's that's a that's a pretty sizable improvement uh, compared to a month ago. Also, North, North Dakota uh, was adjusted was adjusted upward as well as Iowa, and so uh, and so you can see why uh, you, you know with these state estimates, you can see why there was an increase in the U.S. estimate. Yeah, the ones that really matter, I think, the most are obviously are going to be Minnesota and Iowa. And those are pretty sizable percentage changes on a one-month basis. Uh, Minnesota up almost 5% compared to a month earlier, and Iowa up 2.6%. So those are really the drivers behind it. Indiana kind of came in third place, maybe, in terms of that 1.5% increase that we saw uh, in Indiana. And if you look at the drought monitor, 
and compare that to when we did our last webinar, which coincides with more or less the release of uh, USDA's August uh, WASD report, you can kind of see what was going on. So I've split this into a couple of different slides here. Uh, the first one looks at the August 10th drought monitor versus September 7th, the most recent drought monitor. And it looks kind of at that Western part of the Corn Belt. And you can see some improvement as you look at North Dakota. There's still a lot of dryness up there, but it's a better situation than it was in August. The same story with respect to South Dakota. And even as you get down to Kansas, things looked a little better in September than they did in August. When you flip forward and then look at the um, kind of the north central uh, part of the Corn Belt, um, you really see some change as indicated by USDA with respect to Minnesota and Iowa. And notice in particular uh, that southern half of Minnesota, how the red pretty much disappears on the September 7th drought monitor. Same story with respect to Iowa, the red really disappears and even some of the uh, more dry conditions in the brown areas actually dissipated during that course of the time. Uh, as you look at Indiana, maybe the interesting thing about Indiana is we actually got a little bit drier here, at least in our part of the Eastern Corn Belt here in Indiana. And I think the question mark there is gonna be what impact that might have on soybean production coming out of Indiana. But in general, uh, there was enough moisture improvement from the August timeframe to the September timeframe to give us some improvement in those yield estimates. And I always kind of look at the drought monitor as kind of a, a lagging indicator because it moves kind of slowly. And I think as a lot of producers know, the timely rains that occurred late in the growing season were probably enough to have some impact on, on yield. Um, if you look at total corn production, uh, that combination of more acreage and, and better yield does give us a, an estimated crop size of 15 billion bushels. That would be the second largest on record. The only crop size larger than that would be back in the 2016 crop year at 15.15 billion bushels. So it's a relatively large crop um, despite some of the weather problems we've had uh, this year. And as you look at the ending stocks estimates that USDA has published, I mentioned earlier that they raised their estimate of the ending stocks coming out of the um, 2020 crop year into the 2021 crop year. You can see how those change dramatically as we move through the course of the crop year. Now, these last couple of reports have raised those ending stocks from the 2020 crop year into the 2021 crop year. So you can kind of see the the slowdown that was taking place with respect to usage uh, at the end of the 2020 crop year. And then we take a look at their initial estimates for the 2021 crop year. Uh, notice the big gyration there, right? In July, they were estimating we'd carry over about 1.43 billion bushels from 2021 into 2022. Last month with that surprisingly small yield number, um, that came down to 1.24 billion bushels. Now we're back up over 1.4 billion bushels of carryover from 21 into the 2022 crop year. I think that indicates how tough it is to forecast those ending stocks estimates, especially this early in the crop year. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out as we go forward. Um, if you look at that balance sheet change and look at the corn ending stocks as a percentage of usage, I mentioned earlier, uh, the 2020 crop estimate ending stocks now at 7.9%. That's a little higher than it was earlier in the, in the year. And then the 2021 estimate is now up to 9.5% of projected usage. That's about a one point increase compared to what they were looking at a month ago when it was projected at about 8.5%. So it's still relatively tight with respect to ending stocks. That still leaves us below that 10% mark that I think a lot of people in the marketplace like to look at. But I think the key point is it's been moving in the wrong direction as those ending stocks estimates relative to usage have been climbing here now for, for a bit. On the world side, uh, a small increase from about 24% carryover to about 25%. Um, I don't want to downplay that too much because a 1% move on world stock levels is significant, right? It's, it's hard to move those world stock levels very far, very fast, but it's still not a huge increase with respect to world stock levels. And then when you start looking at exports and looking at what was going on with respect to U.S. exports uh, in total versus exports to China, uh, total corn exports, and this is based on the shipment data, the weekly shipment data from the Foreign Ag Service, up about 55% compared to the prior year. 
uh, with the rise in exports to China really accounting for over 80% of the increase in exports we had in, in the 2020 crop year. Exports really slowed down over the summer and maybe a little more than, than a lot of us were expecting, especially towards the tail end of the summer. You take a look at the upcoming crop year, uh, the next marketing year purchases, take a look at those as well and compare those to prior years. So in each case, we're looking at export commitments for the new crop year from the first week of the new crop marketing year. And if you look at the corn side, and we'll talk about the contrast here with soybeans a little later, um, things don't look too bad, right? Total export commitments up uh, compared to uh, 2020 at just short of a billion bushels versus 742 million uh, bushels this time last year. Uh, export commitments to China at 469 million bushels this year versus 347 at the same time last year. So some positive news there. Um, and the question I think continues to be, what is China going to do with respect to corn imports? And so much of that is tied up with what's going to take place with respect to China's hog herd inventories. And of course, that brings us back to what's going on with African swine fever in China. Uh, there's also some political considerations in addition to that. So we've got a lot of factors going on there, but there's been a lot of reports lately that African swine fever has really come back in a big way in China. That could impact negatively their need for corn from the U.S. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out, whether or not we continue to have those export commitments to China remaining above what they were this time last year. Um, I think there's a lot of question marks there with respect to what's going to take place on those on those uh, foreign exports to China. Michael, what's your take on that from an international perspective? I think you're you're exactly right. I think China is going to be the key player here, uh, and and if it, it looks if it looks like it uh, looks like that African swine fever uh, is a little bit uh, stronger than it has been uh, in the last year, that's certainly going to that's certainly going to hurt. Uh, you know, not only uh, not only uh, exports from uh, U.S., but also exports from other countries, and so that's something we'll have to keep definitely keep an eye on. And we're not going to get into this too much today, but uh, that also creates some question marks with respect to what's going to happen to pork exports from the U.S. to China. Uh, a lot of a lot of uncertainty with that as well in terms of the Chinese trying to maintain their meat supplies domestically. Uh, on the ethanol front, no change this month compared to last month. Uh, 5.2 billion bushels. So USDA is still forecasting um, a modest rise and recovery in ethanol usage as we project out through the 2021 crop year. Um, keep in mind, you know, I think sometimes those those changes look kind of small, but actually you think about it uh, compared, for example, to the 2019 crop year, um, that's a pretty significant recovery. So it's going to be interesting to see if we're able to maintain that going forward. If you look at the ethanol margins, those production margins have been pretty good. This is based on the Iowa State data where they maintain kind of a, a simulation of, a, of the ethanol plant uh, and estimate those margins above uh, variable cost. And notice on the right hand side, now this is data, the last observation is from the week before Labor Day. So we don't have last week's data yet, but still pretty positive outlook with respect to those margins. Uh, and really coming about because of the decline in corn prices that took place towards the end of, of the month there that really kind of helped improve those margins. If you look at weekly ethanol production values and compare them to the pre pandemic era, they were starting to look pretty good in July uh, and maybe even spilling over into the beginning of August. But as we went through August, you can see how those production numbers were starting to fall behind the pre-pandemic era. And I think, you know, the real question mark for the rest of the fall and into the winter is going to be what's going to happen with respect to travel demand. And, and Nathan, you and I were talking about this earlier before the webinar started. I mean, this is really kind of a big question mark in terms of what's going to happen with respect to the recovery of the economy and how that plays into ethanol demand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the pandemic, unfortunately, is not behind us, and that continues to have impacts on travel, which again translates to what we're talking about here in terms of demand for corn through ethanol. So if you look at USDA's projection of marketing year average prices, they did pull back pretty sharply their estimate for the 2021 crop year. They pulled it back from 575 last month to 545. And I guess 
I don't look at that so much as a forecast as more of a rec- reflection of reality, right? Because the market year average is really a function heavily of how much corn is marketed in the first few months, especially about the first four or five months of the marketing year. And you simply look at the bids, and Nathan, you're going to take a look at those in a second. You look at the bids, and it's clear to the extent that we market some corn here in the fall, it's going to be at some prices that are below what USDA is projecting. And they had to pull that back. So I don't know that that necessarily is a forecast or an indicator of what's going to take place, for example, after the first of the year but it is a reflection of the bids that we're looking at here in the short run. And you've taken a look at that. So let's take a look at those cash forward contract bids starting off with you, Nathan. Yeah, so just kind of thinking about, you know, what's going on on the marketing side. I want to start out just looking at some current uh, forward contract bids for an elevator here in in central Indiana. Um, And so the the dark gold line there that runs across the bottom is the current forward contract bids. Uh, So you can see, you know, right now we're looking at bids around $4.92, really from now through about the end of the year, their bids are um, uh, pretty constant, that $4.90, $4.92 range. Uh, We can see those bids kind of start to go up there uh, after the the first of the year. And again, you got to think about what underlies those bids. There's both uh, carry and futures market, which we'll talk about in a minute, as well as basis. And again, we'll talk about basis as well. Um, The other two lines on the chart here are kind of an implied break-even price for both uh, on-farm storage and then just kind of a hypothetical commercial storage scenario. So the the gray bar that kind of runs through the middle there, that's that's our on-farm storage scenario. So basically, I'm just assuming um, given the current bid today of $4.92, if you were to store that corn uh, on-farm, and I assess a one cent per bushel per month on farm storage costs and then a 6% APR uh, on the opportunity cost of, of holding on to that grain, you can see that uh, what you'd have to sell that grain for in the future is going to be higher. So for example, if you forego that $4.92 today stored on farm, uh, you'd have to um, be looking for a, a $5.16 cash price uh, if you were going to store it till April to just break even, right, to just offset those storage costs. And you can see from the chart there that the, the current forward contract bid is right there at that five dollar and sixteen cent uh, cash price out in April, which would you know uh, make you just as well off uh, if you were to store or you were to sell today. The the commercial storage costs are obviously a little bit higher, and so the economics are a little bit different. So again, mine is just kind of a hypothetical scenario. You'd want to calculate this for your own situation, but I'm assuming four cent per bushel per month uh, for on farm or excuse me for commercial storage. And then again, the same 6% APR for opportunity costs. And you can see that uh, the, the implied kind of break even there is quite a bit higher. So if you're going to forgo that $4.92 cash bid today, you know, looking out into April, you'd be looking at a, a cash price of $5.37 to be kind of just, in, just equivalent to just offset uh, those commercial storage costs. So, you know, really what I think we can see here is there's, there's a couple of things going on. That is, there you know there are some price opportunities out there for folks, um, but we really need to be able to uh, make a distinction between um, uh, these on-farm and, and commercial storage scenarios and kind of do the, the kind of back of the envelope calculations for your own farm to assess you know what are your storage costs and what are the uh, alternatives or the bids that you're being offered uh, and kind of do some calculations there to figure out uh, where those bids fall. So we'll kind of come back to that and, and talk about that from more of a strategy perspective here towards the end a little bit. But you've also taken a look at what's going on with basis. And this has turned out to be a very interesting year with respect to basis, especially these last few weeks, right? Yeah. So, you know, as as we kind of transition from uh, one marketing year to the next, you know, there's just a lot going on. We've really already alluded to that in, in kind of your uh, assessment of the supply and demand situation, Jim. Uh, but if we drill down on basis, and again, basis is one of the underlying components of those cash bids that I just showed you, there is, there's a lot going on. So we're coming off of really strong basis, um, really for the past year, um, we've seen pretty strong basis. Um, and then we've got some other factors that are influencing uh, our, our basis levels regionally. So here to start with, we're looking at uh, central Indiana corn basis. And so the blue line there is the three-year historical average. And so you can see that typically we see basis patterns, you know, somewhere in that uh, 
15 to 20 cents under in the fall and then kind of appreciating uh, through the crop marketing year. This year, the black line is, is the current year's basis. So we're two weeks into the marketing year here. Um, basis is well above that average, right? Really, really strong basis here as again, we transition from one crop marketing year to the next. We're not really into the thick of harvest. We're just getting going. There's some places that are really looking to um, uh, pull corn out of the bins that's left. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking at basis levels that are 75 cents to 50 cents uh, above futures prices. And again, there, there's a couple things here. One, we're starting at a strong level, but you can see there's already this kind of, um, uh, from week one to week two, this drop in basis that was pretty significant. I mean, you're looking at probably a, a 10 to 15 cent drop in basis uh, between the first two weeks of the, the crop marketing year. Um, if we look on the next slide, we can we can look at this kind of from a slightly different angle, and that is looking at what's going on in other parts of the state, right? So again, I started in central Indiana as kind of our representation. If you look in the southern part of the state, it's really not just southern Indiana, it's southern Indiana, southern Illinois, which is also in the crop basis tool in southern Ohio, really those river markets, uh, which are largely driven by export demand. Uh, basis is not near as strong, right? It, it came down much more quickly. And a lot of that has to do with um, the, the hurricane and, and the situation in the Gulf with uh, a lack of electricity and some potential damage to the uh, ports down there. And so not only uh, are we starting at a lower level, right? So basis came down pretty quickly down there uh, um, in those Southern regions because of that, uh, those difficulties in the Gulf, but we're still seeing basis, you know, really, uh, weakening in those areas uh, the same way that we see it weakening here. So, you know, not only are we seeing some weakening in basis, and I think we expect to see that to continue as we move into harvest, that's that's the typical pattern that we would, we would see anyway. I think that that could move um, differently in different locations because we have some different dynamics as it relates to export demand versus, you know, we'll talk about ethanol demand here uh, in just a second and how that plays out differently in different locations. Yeah, I don't think we can uh, really overstate the impact of the hurricane because on those export channels, it's really uh, caused exports to grind to a halt. Um, some of the elevators, I think, have come back online, but some of them are still offline, still don't have power. And, you know, I think the, the damage to the grain shipping industry is probably, uh, at least initially, as every bit as strong as it was when we had Katrina 16 years ago. Um, how that plays out over the next few weeks is going to be really important in terms of our ability to recapture some export channels uh, and export market opportunities. So uh, it's going to be important that those elevators get back online and we get that Mississippi River uh, flow uh, into those export channels back on, uh, on track with a more normal pattern. So I mentioned earlier that the ethanol margins on production look pretty good. And you've taken a look at Indiana um, ethanol plant basis as well, right? Yeah, so again, we've been looking at this for a while and, and there's kind of a lot going on here. So just to give you really what I think is the most important stuff. So I've got um, several years of historical basis data uh, for Indian, Indian ethanol plants and then the current year's data. So the current year would be the black line over here on the left-hand side, starting you know at about 50 cents and, and shooting up there to about 60 cents in week two of the marketing year. So really what I want to point out there is you can see uh, the purple line is uh, last year. So the 2020-2021 crop marketing year. We ended the year with really strong basis. You can see that on the right-hand side of the chart. We're just carrying that over at the beginning of this crop marketing, marketing year with strong ethanol plant basis uh, here in Indiana. Um, if you look at some of those other lines and maybe just try to take an average through the middle of them, right? We're, we're easily, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 cents above what I would say is average for this time of the year. And you can see as opposed to uh, the, uh, the basis values I showed you from the crop basis tool, which is average all locations, ethanol plants and uh, elevators and, and everything in the one number, ethanol plant basis has not declined in the first two weeks of the crop marketing year, but has actually shot up. Uh, and again, there, there's a number of reasons that may have happened in terms of, again, ethanol plants having continued need for corn and, and really, you know, pretty tight carryover from, from one crop marketing year to the next. And so they may be bidding those prices up uh, to kind of pull that corn out of the bins. Also, as Jim just showed, you know, uh, we've had relatively good margins at the ethanol plants. And so they really can bid pretty competitively for that corn. I think the question is, you know, what do we expect to happen here over uh, the next several months? And, you know, I wouldn't expect to see, uh, 
basis uh, at these ethanol plants continue to increase, I would expect at harvest, as we have you know an ample amount of corn available, that that basis will follow that pattern of uh, weakening here through the fall a little bit. But I think what what I would say based on this chart is um, that we've seen ethanol kind of um, uh, take its place as the, the market leader, uh, at least in a lot of these regions where we have ethanol. So, you know, looking back a couple of years, you know, ethanol was always kind of the leader uh, in, in those basis markets in terms of being competitive and bidding for corn. That kind of went away, right? If you think about um, uh, what's happened with the, the pandemic and, and travel demand and how that has affected the ethanol industry, uh, the last year, maybe even getting close to 18 months or two years, that, that has been impacted and uh, has had a, a big impact on basis. But we saw uh, as, as production really ramped back up uh, at the uh, summer of 21 or so, uh, that that has really kind of cemented uh, these ethanol plants as leaders in these markets in terms of being competitive and bidding for corn. So Nathan, looking ahead and trying to think about what ethanol plant basis might do, and this is on an average, of course, for the dozen or 13 plants or so here in Indiana that, that you've captured. Um, I look at that and think, well, we're probably going to see ethanol plant basis weaken and maybe see it drop back to where we were, for example, in the fall of the 2019-2020 crop year, which is the red line on your chart. Does that, does that make sense to you? Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. Again, it's it's really hard to say the exact level that that 2019-2020 number would probably be a, a reasonable place uh, to think about it going. But again, there's so much going on uh, with supply and demand, and you know, like we we've mentioned, that the pandemic has not gone away, and so you know, travel demand is going to impact you know these these ethanol plant margins greatly. And so you know, I think. And as opposed to a specific level, I would expect ethanol plant basis to stay strong, whether it's at that 2019, 2020 level or somewhere above or below that. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that red line might be a good place uh, to think about maybe where it bottoms out this fall before, again, you know, I would expect there to be some strength as we move uh, into the crop marketing year. It, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where the basis should be substantially stronger than what it was in the fall of 19. It's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah, uh, I think and, that's and that's quite a bit weaker than where we are today. I, I think that's the key point. As you look ahead over the next, what, three to four weeks, we're going to see that ethanol plant basis weaken rather appreciably compared to what you were capturing in these first couple of weeks, right? Sure. All right. So you've taken a look at corn futures price spreads and, uh, those have changed a lot. You and I were talking earlier today about how those have changed since we did some of our earlier webinars back in May and June. So you might take a look at those and, and tell us how they've changed and how that implies, uh, what that implies for marketing strategy. Yeah. So again, going back to the forward contract bids that, that I showed right there a few slides ago, the, the, the appreciation in those prices that we see through the crop marketing year are both made up of of appreciation and basis, right? Higher basis bids later in the marketing year, as well as carry in the futures market, right? So the positive spread between uh, nearby and more deferred futures contracts. And so uh, what we're looking at here is those, those spreads uh, between um, the uh, futures contracts, December 21, March 22, May 22, and July 22. And so where we sit today, right? As you look out uh, through the marketing year, uh, we have this positive stair step uh, kind of pattern, which is you know, theoretically what we generally expect to see, the futures market telling us that uh, it's, it's um, incentivizing us or paying us a premium to, to store that grain from now until some point in the future. And so if you look you know, between the December and the July, uh, nearby December and July 22 corn futures, we've got about 15 cents uh, of carry in that market. And as you mentioned, you know, that has changed a little bit. So again, we talk a little bit uh, about some uh, storage hedge strategies where you hedge prior to harvest into the nearby December contract and then roll that hedge forward. And where that gets important is, again, as it relates to these spreads. So you know, what is the relationship of these futures contracts over time? So earlier in the marketing year, or excuse me, pre-harvest, right, earlier in the year, um, those spreads tend to be a little bit narrower. So, you know, if you look back in, say, uh, May of this year, we did our webinar, I think, on May 14th, um, the spread between the December and the July futures contract was about six cents. So that July 22 futures contract was only trading for six cents higher than the December 21 contract back in May. 
And again, we've done some research in this area looking at how those spreads uh, ch change over time and they tend to widen as you move towards expiration uh, of the December contract or as we move towards harvest essentially. And so we can see that this year that is, has followed that pattern. And so we've gone from about six cents uh, of premium between that uh, December and July futures contract to now we're up to about 15 cents. And typically we see that uh, spread reach its widest really uh, in the fall at or near expiration of the December contract. And so, you know, there's certainly, if you look at the kind of average spread between those two contracts, it's maybe somewhere in that 20 cent range. So there's there's a little bit more to be had, right? If you think about, well, if, if, if I'm one of these folks that have made some, some hedges into uh, December corn futures, should I be rolling those contracts? You know, I, I think we're definitely at a, a level where that would be reasonable. I think there's also potentially maybe another nickel uh, in there in terms of that that widening, but we're at a point in the year where you really have to be paying attention closely to those spreads. Because again, again, there's a lot of fundamentals affecting these markets and, and um, that could go either way. Typically we would expect it to widen maybe just a little bit more here over the next four to six weeks, but you really want to stay on top of that because we're at a point where again, you, you picked up uh, easily a dime uh, and if you roll that hedge forward, you would lock in uh, that spread as, as part of the gain of the futures contract. So this is another example, though, of if you want to do some pricing in the spring, you should be looking closely at making those hedges in the nearby new crop futures, which would be the Ds in the case of corn, and we'll talk later about soybeans. But uh, and then look for an opportunity if you want to take advantage of your storage facilities of rolling that hedge forward. And this is a case in point where um, obviously placing hedges back in in May looks pretty good from just a futures price movement standpoint. But also, you have this opportunity to capture the improvement in the spread. And so, keep that in mind. Another example of, of how that strategy has played out here in, in 2021. So, you took a quick look at March corn futures and uh, said, What's, What is March offering us? Yeah, so we just took a quick look at kind of uh, maybe a strategy looking at making some sales uh, after the first of the year, right? There's probably some folks that are going to obviously make some sales for things that they can't store here. Uh, at harvest, but you know there might be some folks that are trying to defer some income into uh, 2022. And so, what are the what are the alternatives, or what are the opportunities as to maybe looking at a relatively short term, right? Get us through harvest into the first of the year. What would the, the pricing opportunities be? So, if you look at uh, today, March 22 corn futures are at 521. Uh, I went to the crop basis tool in Central Indiana and looked for what I expected basis to be. Um, based on the, the historical basis levels in January. So that's typically about five under, and that's, you know, that's much weaker than where we are today. But again, I think we, we would all agree that we expect basis to kind of weaken here over the harvest period. Uh, but if you look at that historical average, five cent under would be normal in January. That would put us at a, a cash price of $5 and 16 cents, uh, which is, um, you know, pretty reasonable price, I think, by by any means. Uh, again, you need to account for potential storage costs. I have not accounted for that here, so you need to deduct three or four months worth of storage costs, depending on when harvest would be for you. Um, but really, the point is, you know, as you think about strategies here over the next three or four months, um, our research has shown there's there's pretty there's very little risk associated with storage strategies through the end of the year. As you look further down the road, right, there's there's a lot more uh, that can happen. But in the short run, uh, as you look over, you know, between now and the end of the year, um, storing that, whether you were to take a, a position in the futures market or just store it on hedge, right, uh, at least a, a, a portion of the, the crop that you stored, that's really not a terrible strategy. You, you know, again, you want to be paying attention. There's a lot going on in these markets. but uh, if you wanted to store some corn uh, through the end of the year and not take a position in the futures market, I, I don't think that that would be a super risky strategy uh, based on where we are with carryovers. But, um, you know, again, you, you'd want to stay on top of that. Yeah, so I think, you know, when you looked at, I think, what, 30 or 32 years of history, um, on average, the risk of, of that being a bad strategy was very low as long as you were looking at moving the corn by either December or maybe early January, right? So for right. a lot of our viewers are probably thinking, okay, I've made some corn sales, given what's happened with prices here over the last uh, couple of months, maybe they wish they'd sold more, but still I've made some corn sales and are asking themselves, you know, what about the remainder of the crop? What should I do with it? Um, storing a good bit of that, uh, 
it's a pretty low risk strategy, particularly if you're looking at moving that coin in December or January, right? That's kind of, I mean, there's could be some changes in fundamentals or as, as you mentioned, but the risk would be the yields wind up being higher. higher. Um, the risk would be that exports dry up. The risk would be that uh, we have even less of a recovery in the U.S. economy and maybe less demand, for example, for ethanol. So there are some risk factors that could make that strategy not turn out well. But historically, that's been a, a pretty good strategy. And so it's not unreasonable to think about doing that again this year. All right, let's turn our attention to soybeans for a bit. Um, so if you look at the changes in the September World Ag Supply Demand Estimates, um, on last year's balance sheet, the 2020 crop, they did reduce the soybean crush by 15 million bushels, and that helped push the carryover from the 2020 crop year into the 2021 crop year up to 175 million bushels. That's equal to almost 4% of usage. Um, looking at the soybean crop balance sheet for the 21 crop, they pushed the yield up about six tenths of a bushel to 50.6 bushels per acre. That helped push production up by 35 million bushels. Um, they did reduce the estimated crush for the 21 crop, but they raised exports at the same time. So the ending stocks estimate bottom line went up to 185 million bushels being carried over from the 21 crop year into the 2022 crop year. And that's equal to about uh, just a little over 4% of usage. So both of those numbers are higher than what we were looking at earlier in the year. And I really think that's the key there. On the world side, no change in the other Brazil's or Argentina's estimated production for the 2021, 2022 crop years, and no change in China's projected imports from all sources, not just the US. So on the yield side, I mentioned that they went up to 50.6. Um, that really puts that yield estimate very close to most people's trend line estimates. Um, but the, I think the real question was, will that yield estimate go up again in October? Because if you look at the improvement in weather conditions that we saw showing up on those drought maps earlier in the, in the program, um, that's probably more significant with respect to possible impact on soybean yields and corn yields, right? So typically you think about an improvement in growing conditions in late August, early September, having good potential to have some impact on soybean yields. And I'm not sure that uh, we fully captured the impact of that improvement in moisture conditions uh, in some of those states. Michael, you took a look at the soybean yield information on a state-by-state -state basis on this report. You might comment on that. Yeah, just what you're talking about there, Jim. Uh, you could explain a possible never another half bushel increase in soybean yields. We certainly saw some increases uh, looking at, at in September compared to August, uh, particularly in North Dakota and Minnesota. Uh, the increase in Minnesota was extremely large, uh, a 9.3% uh, uh, higher uh, yield estimate in, in September compared to August, but also Iowa was up 1.7%. So you're seeing some states with some pretty large production, North Dakota, Minnesota, and, and Iowa uh, that saw some some fairly large increases, uh, you know, in September compared to, to August. And so if we see further increases, you know, based on the, the improved crop conditions we saw in the last two or three weeks, uh, that, that could push that yield closer to 51. Yeah, looking at the yield map, I guess uh, where you would expect to see possible further increases would be in those uh, key northern states, as you mentioned. Although, you know, you look at the increase in Minnesota, that was pretty substantial from August to September. So maybe they've already got it built in. Um, on the downside, uh, here in the eastern Corn Belt, the one that maybe is at a little bit of risk is Indiana, as we've gotten drier. Uh, we're not in a severe drought, but it has been pretty dry in, in a good bit of Indiana. So that could pull us back a little bit. And then as USDA pointed out on their report, um, at this stage, it was too early to, to gauge the impact of the hurricane on, on yields in the south. And so we could see some pullback down there. So that's that's kind of the wild part at this point. Uh, yeah, um, USDA is per, uh, currently projecting the Indiana soybean yield to be be a record uh, at 60 bushel. And, and just, a, just, just a, a point of reference here, uh, the crop conditions in 16 and 18 are actually better than what they are this year uh, for soybeans in Indiana. And so that, that 60 could be a little optimistic. Yeah, so this next slide maybe shows why you and I were talking about the possibility of, of yields going up, right? Yeah, definitely. You can see in the last two or three weeks that that, uh, that red line, which is the 2021 uh, for the U.S., uh, is, has, is, 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 is higher. Uh, you know, even though 21 is, is pretty low compared to some of the other years, uh, we have seen that improvement in the last two or three weeks. And, 
And, and that's why we think that there, there could even be more potential uh, for that U.S. soybean yield increase. Yeah, we're probably at the point now where weather conditions from this point forward might not make much difference, but where we're really talking about is have we captured the improvement that took place in some of these locations really the last two or three weeks, maybe the last four weeks. So if you look at soybean production, um, a little like corn, this is the second largest crop on record, right? I projected a 4.37 billion bushels, just slightly below the 2018 crop, which was a 4.43 billion bushels. So that small improvement in the yield uh, did push us up and put us in second place with respect to total total production. Uh, soybean exports this summer were very, very slow. Um, we mentioned that I think last month, that continued to be the case uh, here over these last few weeks. If you look at the export numbers for the 2020 crop, I think maybe the interesting thing is that 58% of 2020 soybean crop exports went to one country, namely China. Um, that just illustrates how important Chinese demand for U.S. soybeans is to the so total demand uh, for soybeans coming out of the U.S. If you look at the numbers for the upcoming crop year, this picture looks different than what we saw for corn earlier. Um, if you look at, remember for corn, the total export commitments to all destinations for the 2021 crop was larger than in 2020. It's the opposite in soybeans. If you look at the export commitments to China for soybeans versus last year, they're smaller. That's the opposite of what we saw in corn. So the export picture on soybeans looks a little more perilous, I guess, compared to the you know, corn export uh, projections. Um, and if you look at it from a number standpoint, to all destinations, those 2021 crop export commitments are down about 35% compared to this time last year. Uh, and China alone accounts for almost, not quite 60% of that decline. Um, so that just illustrates again, how important what happens in China is to our total uh, demand picture for, for soybeans uh, in the export channels. If you look at the ending stocks forecast for the 2020 crop, of course, they collapsed earlier in the year, and we got them down to 120 million bushels there in that February, March, April time frame. And, and then since then, USDA has kind of gradually been bumping those up. And a lot of that has been because of soft exports. I think I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the change this month was largely because USDA reduced the crush estimate, the domestic crush estimate. But bottom line, instead of 120 million bushel carryover, which was essentially pipeline supplies, we wound up uh, according to the USDA and the September report, carrying over 175 million bushels of soybeans from the 2020 crop into the 2021 crop year. That's still a small number, but it's a big change relative to that 120 we were talking about earlier in the year. If you look at some of these early estimates then for the 2021 crop, the carryover into the 2022 crop year, uh, for three months in a row, USDA was sitting on 155 million bushels. They bumped that up. 185 this month. And Michael, uh, if you think about what we've been talking about, the possibility of maybe seeing a little bit of a yield bump, it wouldn't be surprising to me to see that projected carryover in future reports climb above the 200 million bushel mark. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think you're I think you're definitely right. But what amazes me so much about everything you, everything we've been talking about here, the second largest crop in terms of soybean production. And we still have such a low stock to use. And so you, you scratch your head, what is it going to take uh, for that stock to use ratio uh, to increase rather dramatically? And, and I don't have an answer to that question, but the point I want to make out here is, is soybeans are going to be very competitive with corn next year uh, when it comes to acreage decisions. I'm um, jumping ahead there a little bit, but I just wanted to point it out at, at this point uh, that given that very low carryover in soybeans, even if we do see a yield increase, uh, we, we, we still, we're still at a very, very low uh, stocks to use ratio. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and that's, I think, well worth thinking about with respect to both corn and soybeans to some extent. Large production numbers and still relatively tight carryovers. So that's indicative of what's taking place from a world demand standpoint. Um, ending stocks, just to reiterate, 2020 crop, 30.9% carryover into 2021, and then roughly the same of a 4.2% carried over from 21 into 22, depending on how things turn out with respect to those yields. I wouldn't be surprised to see that bump up a little bit. 
Uh, on the world side, a little like corn, those estimates came up about 1%. So we're at 26% world carryover uh, on a stock to use ratio uh, basis compared to 25% a month ago. A month ago. Uh, USDA did pull back their national average cash soybean price estimate to 1290 from 1370. So that's an 80 cent drop in one month. That's a big move. But again, a little like corn was really reflective of what's taking place in the marketplace and the fact that we tend to sell such a large portion of the crop these first four or five months of the market of the year. So it's really more of a reflection of reality than it is necessarily um, a forecast. Nathan, you've taken a look at basis uh, on the soybean side as well. Yeah, so starting out, just looking at um, some uh, forward contract bids for soybeans, uh, you can see that uh, the, the dark uh, brown or gold line there is current uh, forward contract bid. So we're currently in September looking at a bid of $12 and 45 cents. Uh, and as you move, uh, again, the, the, the elevator that I was looking at only had bids uh, through February. They were looking at a February bid of uh, in the ballpark of $12 and 94 cents. Again, that just kind of puts into perspective a little bit of what's going on with both uh, carry in the futures market, as well as uh, at least basis underlying those forward contract bids. And we'll talk about each of those two components. But before I move on, I also want to point out again, I've kind of set this up with both um, an on-farm storage and a commercial storage scenario. So again, the gray line and the light gold bar uh, or line represent um, those kind of implied break evens, right? So if you're going to forgo the $12.45 today, how much would you have to sell for in the future to just kind of offset those on-farm or commercial storage costs? And again, you can see it's it's interesting. Uh, if you look further out into um, the, the crop marketing year, those bids are currently covering um, on-farm storage costs, at least the way that I've assumed them. Uh, and, and if you look really far out into February, you know, that, that cash bid uh, is almost covering um, uh, my assumptions on commercial storage costs. So you know, there's definitely carry in the market. There's definitely some optimism uh, as it relates to kind of the trends and basis as we move forward. But you know, this is really just kind of a framework for thinking about you know, your storage decisions as far as um, you know, what's currently being offered here at Harvest, your costs might be. And again, you want to calculate that for your farm. And then what's going on in terms of the fundamentals here as it relates to both uh, carry and futures markets and, and basis. So, if we jump forward to the basis side of things, um, it's it's different um, in terms of what we saw for corn, but some of the same factors are, are driving that. So again, I'm starting out with uh, soybean basis in central, central Indiana. And again, you can see that that black line, the current year's uh, soybean basis in central Indiana uh, started out relatively strong. Again, we're coming off of a strong basis year in 2020, 2021, but a pretty big drop, uh, even bigger than what we saw uh, for, for corn in those first couple of weeks of the marketing year. And so again, as we kind of move into harvest, we expect to see basis decline. We saw a pretty strong decline there in those first couple of weeks. Uh, the other thing to kind of keep in mind here is again, what's happening uh, geographically, the difference is geographically. So this is central Indiana. On the next slide, uh, I have, again, uh, Southwest Indiana, which is really just a representation of what's happening kind of in those river markets, again, uh, impacted by what's going on in those export markets. And so, again, uh, we're just starting out with much weaker basis. And again, a lot of that derives from what happened in the Gulf with the hurricane and some of the backup that we've seen there as it relates to getting those exports out. And so, um, those river markets not only have taken a, a hit in basis in the first couple of weeks, but really started out quite a bit weaker uh, than what we saw in uh, the northern part of the state, so to speak, or the central part of the state. And so, you know, we got a lot to pay attention to as it relates to marketing, the same as what we said uh, for corn uh, and soybeans is really uh, the same idea, but maybe a little bit uh, stronger hit uh, in terms of what we've seen a basis really early on here in the marketing year. Yeah, Nathan, as you look at those basis values and, um, you know, for Southwest Indiana, and you mentioned earlier, Southern Illinois, Southern Ohio, to see those levels hang in that maybe that average level of recent years, we're going to have to see those export markets kind of recover, right? Yeah, I mean, I would expect that to continue to decline. You know, that's the normal pattern, but it's going to be below those historical years. 
in, unless we see some of that export demand come back, obviously get things opened up in the Gulf uh, so we can even ship stuff if people even want it. And so it's just uh, a lot of stuff's going to have to kind of recover in order to get those uh, turn back around and, and, and towards that, you know, average historical trend. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be important to watch and pay attention to what's happening with respect to those elevators that are near the Gulf and that southern part of the Mississippi region. Because until they come back, those export channels are going to be plugged. And that's uh, that's a problem for, for soybeans and corn. Um, you've taken a look at the futures price spreads and, uh, you know, a little like corn, but actually even stronger than corn, uh, the market's providing an incentive uh, to think about storage, right? Right, and so this, like I said, when we looked at those forward uh, contract bids for soybeans, right, further out into the year, we do see some, some relatively strong forward contract bids currently. And again, that's that's made up of both basis and in, in the, the uh, carry in the futures market. And so you can see here, again, we have this very kind of textbook um, uh, step pattern here of um, the spread between futures contracts. Just for simplicity, I like to like just look at all of it in one big chunk. So from November uh, 21 soybeans to July 22, we're looking at you know positive 24 cent uh, carry, meaning you know that that July 22 futures price is 24 cents higher than the November 21 price. Um, again, if you think about um, the, um, how that spread changes over time, similar to corn, it tends to widen as we move closer to expiration. Obviously, for soybeans, that's a month earlier than uh, for corn. So that contract expires in November. So really, you know, we're uh, six or so weeks away from expiration of that contract. So we're really in that range where we would expect that to be at about its widest point. Um, historically, that that spread, you know, reaches its peak or its widest point um, in this time frame at about 25 to 30 cents. So we basically have reached that expectation if you're just you know building it based on what happens historically. And so again, like I said, for, for corn, I think that if you were somebody that uh, was looking at a uh, strategy where you were looking to roll uh, that new crop November soybean hedge forward to a, a more distant futures contract, um, you would be in, in the range where you'd be wanting to think about doing that or at least paying very close attention to what's going on day to day in these markets uh, as not to lose that. Again, just for perspective, if you look back to uh, May, when we did our May webinar, middle of the month of May, uh, the uh, the new crop soybean futures structure was actually inverted, meaning that the November um, 21 soybeans futures price was trading higher than any of the 2022 uh, soybean futures contracts. So obviously we've seen a big uh, reversal there where it's no longer inverted and actually has positive carry of the market. So that's a pretty big turnaround. Uh, and again, is, is more of the structure we would expect to see in a normal year. And so, you know, if you're a person that has either uh, made some decisions uh, or taken some positions on the board prior to harvest, you know, you're wanting to be in that, that phase where you're thinking about rolling that forward and capturing this spread. Uh, if you haven't taken any positions, right, there are some, some positive carry to be had if you were looking at making some storage hedging decisions, uh, looking out into, you know, next spring or next summer based on the structure that we're seeing here. So again, you know, you got to kind of take all of these factors into consideration uh, when you're making those decisions. Yeah, the, the turnaround in the spread on those futures contracts was quite dramatic this year, right? It was, yeah, really big change. I think, you know, not only was the market inverted again, you know, just several months ago in May, but I think it was, you know, 40 or, or 50 cents inverted, meaning that, you know, the, the November 21 contract was trading for 40 or 50 cents higher than the more uh, deferred contracts, you know, out into July of 22, which is, a pretty big uh, uh, negative spread. And then not only has that reversed, but we've gotten back to what I would call a pretty normal uh, spread between those two contracts. And so uh, pretty pretty big reversal. Uh, and again, that has, I think, a lot to do with the, the tight carryovers that we've had um, and, and how that's affected, you know, thinking about uh, demand for soybeans out into kind of the later parts of this current market we Yeah. So you've also taken a look at you know, if you if you chose to do some pricing today, using in this case March futures, uh, what kind of a price do you think you're locking in based on the basis forecast, right? Yes, yeah, again, just thinking about you know some relatively short-term strategies for people looking to make some sales around the turn of the year, so over the next three or four months. Um, 
So March 22 soybeans are on the futures market are currently trading for $12.92. Again, I went to the crop basis tool in central Indiana and tried to pull out a bid, um, a basis bid um, for January, that January timeframe. Uh, and that was about 25 cents under. So again, if you kind of convert that to a cash price, that's a $12.67 cash price. Um, so again, as you think about the strategy over the next several months, very similar to corn, you know, I talked about the, the relatively low risk, at least historically, as you think about um, uh, some storage decisions between now and the end of the year, you know, storing on hedge is probably not the worst strategy, especially on, you know, a portion of the crop. Uh, as you're looking to, to think about what you're going to do with, with some corn that you haven't made sales on. Um, if you think about it historically, uh, you know, soybeans tend to have a lot more upside as you look kind of further out into the crop marketing year, but uh, similar to corn in the short run, right, to the end of the year, there tends to be relatively low risk to storing that corn on hedged. Um, and again, I think that if you, if you think about um, the supply side with, with soybeans having tighter carryovers than corn, um, that that's probably again a relatively low risk uh, strategy, but again you got to factor in what's going on the demand side, which is um, complex to say the least in terms of predicting uh, what's going to happen here in the next several months, which will also have an impact on this. So you got to got to really pay attention. Um, but but over the short run, you probably could, could store some soybeans on hedge and, and, and feel pretty good about that decision. Yeah, you and I have talked about this in the past, Nathan. So for I think many of our viewers are probably uh, doing their marketing strategy, they've got a portfolio of things they're using, right? And many of them have already done some pricing for this 2021 crop. And the question is, what do they do with the remainder? And our suggestion, I guess, is with respect to both corn and soybeans, depending on what percentage you've sold coming in, um, storing a significant portion of that crop uh, until later in the fall is probably a relatively low risk strategy by, by historical standards. Now, admittedly, you know, there's some things going on in 2021 that we don't really have any history on with respect to COVID and African swine fever, et cetera. So there are some risk factors out there, but historically being able to store uh, for the next several months has been a relatively low risk strategy and it provides an opportunity, again, historically to, to capture an improvement of returns. And then if you go beyond that, uh, recognize you are absorbing more risk. Um, but historically, again, soybeans have been a better bet than, than corn into that uh, late winter, early spring time frame, right? Yeah, also, guys, I mean, given that we might have some very large crops in, in, in parts of Indiana, if not all of Indiana, if you have some storage constraints, certainly storing those soybeans makes makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, uh, but storing corn also, but if you don't have enough room, uh, I think uh, storing soybeans is, 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 is probably a really good strategy. Yeah, good point. One of the things that's kind of interesting in terms of trying to anticipate the basis movement here this fall, and Nathan and I were talking about this earlier, is the fact that we've pulled the carryover down pretty sharply uh, compared to history. And that's probably freed up a little more storage space from an industry-wide perspective than, than typical, uh, which has enters into the dynamics of, of trying to anticipate what's going to happen with basis. Because we've got a big crop coming on here in the eastern corn belt. Uh, but we pulled the carryover down enough to maybe create some additional space for, for some of these crops, which is going to be a factor. It's going to be hard, hard to figure exactly how much impact that's going to have. So with that, Michael, uh, you've taken a look at uh, estimated returns on that simulated farm that you uh, maintained for White County, Indiana. And, and the numbers look a little different this month than they did 30 days ago. Yeah, the numbers don't look near as optimistic as what they did a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, and so and so we're seeing some declines in in the in the projected net returns for 21 and 22. Uh, you know, part of that obviously is price, but part of that is is higher cost structure, particularly for 22. Uh, just as even if we just have a five percent increase in cash rent uh, in, in 22, we're still looking at break even prices for corn and soybeans that are 10 percent higher. Uh, than what they were in 2021. And so 2022 we, we, is really a combination of both. Uh, some reduction in, in, in projected prices, though prices are still relatively strong compared to what they were uh, certainly from 14 to 19, still relatively strong uh, December 22, November 22. Uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, a combination of lower prices in 22 and that, and that stronger cost is creating a situation where 22 is like a, a break even. 
I, I still think there's some upward pressure for, for cash rents in 22. Uh, you know, I have been saying five to 10%. I think it's closer to 5% now. Uh, and one of the things I do want to comment about this chart, I'm assuming that half the crop is sold uh, for you know, on, the, on the cash market uh, before the first of the year and half is sold after the first of the year. And so there is some people out there that have, that have marketed uh, part of their corn and soybeans earlier this year, they're looking at returns that are, that are stronger than what I'm, what I'm conveying on this chart. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I think we, I think I've, I'm, I'm, I'm reducing my, my um, upward pressure on, on cash rents for 22. But still uh, a 5% move in cash rents would be significant, right? Yeah, that's, that's not small. It certainly would be lower than what we had in 11, 12, and 13. But, uh, you know, going back to that, that that 7 to 13 period, you get those really high uh, increases in cash rent, you have to have several years uh, that are really strong, not just one or two. Uh, and that's the difference between what we're seeing today uh, than what we saw uh, at the start of that ethanol boom, that first six years, 7 to 13. So you've also taken a look at updating some projections for net farm income, which really captures the enter both enterprises, corn and soybeans, yeah, right? The reason I do this is net farm income is what is used to, to cover owner withdrawals for, for family living, uh, to cover principal payments and for expansion. Uh, and so we want to get, we want to get some idea of how much money is available uh, for those things. It, it, it tells a similar story, but this is accrual. And so it, it, it's slightly different. Uh, the average from 2007 to, to 2020 was $125 uh, net farm income per acre. This is a corn soybean rotation, uh, West Central Indiana. Keep that in mind. Uh, 2020 was right at that average, but stronger than what we saw from 14 to 19. Uh, 21 uh, being much better uh, than than average up to that 218, but below what we saw in 10, 11, 12. You know, when we were talking about this uh, chart earlier in the year, we thought maybe 21 was even going to beat uh, 2012. Well, it looks like that's not going to be the case. Uh, with relatively weaker prices than what we saw two, three months ago. And then 22 uh, dropping down to what that, that average is. And so 20, 21 and 22 are, are good years, particularly 21. Uh, but again, they're not as good uh, as what we that run we saw from seven to 13. And so, uh, and so it looks like there's gonna be money for, for owner withdrawals, for family living, uh, make principal payments and some money for expansion, uh, but, uh, but not quite as much as what there was in that earlier period. Uh, and so okay. we're not talking about uh, machine reinvestment in, in this presentation or in this webinar, but there, there's still enough money in 21 that you're gonna, you're gonna see some people looking at uh, 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 making some machine purchases this year. And obviously uh, the strong cash flow has impacted the land value market. We're seeing land values up uh, significantly across the corn belt. So as you look at it, Michael, and, and thinking about this from kind of a longer term perspective, um, these are still pretty good income projections, right? Oh, definitely. Anytime you can hit that average from 2007 to 2020, that's a good period in agriculture, uh, you know, as a whole. And so anytime you can hit that, hit that $120, $125 per acre average, you, you've got some pretty good returns. So a little less optimistic than earlier, but still a pretty positive outlook. And it Definitely. also does reflect kind of what you mentioned earlier. We picked this up on the Ag Economy Barometer surveys. People are worried about the rise in input cost, right? And you've you've shown the impact of that on these budgets, right? It's having an impact. Oh, it's definitely having an impact. And you know, rather than two percent that we've seen, uh, you know, for like the average for the last ten years, with some of those years being higher than two percent, we're seeing something closer to to uh, six, seven, eight percent so far this year in terms of prices paid index. And and when I, as I indicated, when we do my twenty two budgets, we're looking at break even prices that are ten percent higher. Uh, not just one or two costs; it's it's several costs. With fertilizer and cash rent being the biggest two contributing to that, but it's several costs that are contributing uh, to that higher break-even price. So Michael, uh, it strikes me that a 10% rise in the break-even from one year to the next is a pretty big one-year move. How often has that happened in the recent That past? does not happen very often. We certainly saw that, uh, you know, during that 2007 to 2013 period, at least, at least one or two or three of those years, you saw that increase, uh, but it does not happen very often. We haven't seen anything close to that uh, since 2012, 2013. Okay. And then finally, you took a look at corn versus soybeans as people are trying to make those acreage decisions for the 2022 crop year. 
Yeah, this has been changing a little bit from month to month, uh, as you as you might expect it to. And and right now, uh, you know, corn and soybeans both look very competitive uh, in, in 22. And that's why I made that comment earlier. Uh, you know, we've got some strong corn prices, but we got to remember that corn break even price also increased rather dramatically. And, and so soybeans are doing a good job hanging in there uh, in terms of competing for acres in 22. All right, so that wraps up our discussion for this month's webinar. Uh, I want to encourage our viewers and listeners to think about tuning in for our next webinar, which is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, October 13th. Uh, USDA is going to release updated world ag supply demand estimates on October 12th, and so we'll talk about those shortly after the reports come out and provide some updates and, and some new information with respect to marketing strategies. So the details for that will be available on our website, purdue.edu slash commercial ag. And with that, I want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Nathan Thompson and Dr. Michael Langemeyer for joining us today. And on behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm Jim Minter. Thanks for joining us.